beautiful loft apartments. And so Bridges got like, I was going to go and tweet. Oh, yeah. um, and I was like, that's so fun. <laughs> There's a lot that seems good about all that. I'm Very good deal. I mean, me to you. I heard your show today. So, so thank, you for, uh, thank you for supervising this discussion. Yeah. It's not convenient. It's true. You want to grab a snack or something? You're all right. I got myself a of water. That's yes. a good for now. Yeah. Nice to see you. How you been? That's what he had mentioned. Yeah. I haven't seen you. Uh, <laughs> so congratulations. Congratulations. All the wrong reasons, right? Get a tenure house. Um, class is going, you know, I teach Russian foreign policy this semester, and at the same time, you can be students. Not so many. It's a good number because like, it's really a writing intensive okay. seminar, so I didn't really want too many students. But... Um, they're interested in asking the right question, and it's uh, we figure out how to teach. Like, why? And it's all speculate, and it's all speculation. That's all it is, and that's all it can be. Oh, great. They're terrific. We, had, we hosted them here a couple of years ago. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
I'm going to talk to you sometime. I'm uh, I'm going to sit here, but I have to duck out a little bit early. So if you want to join us for lunch or something. Yeah, no, I'd love to, but my, my kid is in transit and he's coming to my, and I'm going to have lunch with him. So I'd like it's like, more important. It's like a one-off opportunity. But in any case, I do what I Okay. I don't know the name. I don't I just want to get the camera okay. moved in right. right. And the mic. Oh, okay. Uh, and so I need to. I'll let you know. Well, are you Yes, he emailed me. Right. So yeah, two-ish. Well, they took away <laughs> here, actually. <laughs> I think they meant to force my hand. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> 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 she, 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 yeah, it's like Monday grade water bottles. All right, folks, why don't we get started? All right, so I am obviously not Tiana Strabel. I'm Carol Savitz. I'm a senior advisor here at the Security Study Program. My area of expertise is Russian foreign policy, which is not the same semester, but I wanted to welcome everybody. Um, in this session, uh, Chris is actually an old friend of mine, and he is an associate professor of international history at top, at Fletcher, where his research, research focuses on technology, geopolitics, economics, and international affairs in Russia. That's quite a list. <laughs> he is the author of Chip War, which is what he's going to talk to us about today, The Fight for the World's Most Critical Technology, A Geopolitical History of the Computer Chip. He is the author of three other books on Russia, and so we know each other, um, including Putinomics, Power and Money in Research at Russia. We Shall Be Masters, Russia Pivot to East Asia from Peter the Great to Putin, and the struggle to save the Soviet economy, Mikhail Gorbachev, and the collapse of the USSR. He has previously served as an associate director of the Brady Johnson Program and Grand Strategy at Yale a lecturer at the New Economic School in Moscow, a visiting researcher at the Carnegie Moscow Center, 
and a research associate at the Brookings Institution and a fellow of the Lipsky Center. And a fellow at the German Marshall Fund's Transatlantic <laughs> Academy. He received his PhD and MA from Yale University and a BA from Harvard, and he's obviously been up the street now. So we're delighted to welcome him and be the usual format. Chris will speak and then we'll do the Q&A. And I apologize if I botch or don't remember everybody's names. So I had it. Floor is yours. Excellent. Well, well, thank you very much, uh, Carol, for presiding over this discussion. Um, it's nice to be back uh, at MIT, where I visit far too infrequently, actually, despite it being 10 minutes down the road. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, well, what I'd like to do is, is share some conclusions from my, my book, Chip War, um, as Carol mentioned, and to start, perhaps, to explain uh, how it was that a historian of the Soviet Union, uh, which is what I really am, uh, came to write a book about semiconductors. Um, I, around seven years ago, I started trying to understand uh, drivers in the uh, in shifts in military power during the Cold War. And I wanted to understand in particular why it was that in the early Cold War, both the United States and the Soviet Union could produce the key military technologies of the early Cold War, nuclear mm -hmm. weapons and long range delivery systems. Whereas by the end of the Cold War, a clear gap had opened in military power that was recognized actually first in the Soviet Union and then later in the United States. Um, and that gap, as I uh, studied some of the systems that were um, were, were driving the, the gap in military power that opened up, was not really explained by specific military systems, specific planes or specific missiles, communications capabilities. But there was a, a trend that uh, linked all of the uh, new capabilities that were impacting the balance of military power. And that, that trend, uh, that component was computing power. Um, and, and that struck me as something that was sort of, on the one hand, blindingly obvious. We've been told that computers are really important uh, for the entirety of our lives. On the other hand, really unexplored because it seemed to me a real puzzle uh, that the Soviet Union couldn't produce computing power if, as it became clear, uh, the leaders of the Soviet Union were well aware that computing was fundamentally important. And as it turns out, if you uh, begin to explore the writings of Soviet military theorists or the Soviet general staff in the 1970s and 1980s, before the United States, they were beginning to realize the ways in which the United States military's application of computing, sensing communications uh, technologies to military systems were beginning to transform the capabilities of the US military in a way the US military didn't really realize until the Persian Gulf War. But Soviet defense theorists had understood at least a decade earlier. And so there wasn't a, a knowledge gap in the Soviet Union that explained why they didn't acquire the relevant technologies and then deploy them to military systems. There was a production gap which seemed like a little bit of a puzzle because if you'd asked me when I started this project, what are the ingredients that you would need to produce computing? I would have said, well, you need smart physicists. Well, check the Soviets had a lot of smart physicists. You need a big budget. Well, they had the, uh, one of the largest defense budgets in the world, perhaps the largest thing how you measure it. Um, you need a economy that is focused above all on producing technologies for military systems. What is exactly what the Soviet economy had been set up to do uh, since uh, since Stalin's industrialization began in the late 1920s. Uh, and so a lot of the key ingredients that I uh, assumed were critical to producing computing systems were very much present in the Soviet Union. And of course, uh, as we know, Silicon Valley emerged not in the Soviet Union, but California. And so that struck me as a puzzle. And it was more of a puzzle when I realized that the key technologies that undergird all of our computing today, not only in military systems, but in civilian systems, emerged out of missile systems. The first semiconductors uh, were invented for missile guidance systems. The desire to miniaturize computing power so that it could fit in the nose cone of a missile uh, was something that only the Pentagon was willing to pay for in the late 1950s and late 1960s, and really only the Pentagon realized that it wanted. There was extraordinary demands from the space race and from the missile race during the Cold War to shrink computing power, to put it into guidance systems, uh, to use it to guide missiles more accurately. And this uh, desire to miniaturize computing set off not only vast changes in military technology, uh, but also um, all of the technological shifts that we take for granted today. And so it seemed to me, actually, that there was an interesting story here about the production of semiconductors, why it's so complex and difficult to produce semiconductors, uh, and the distribution of power on the world stage today, not only military power, and of course, semiconductors are still critical to the production of military power in ways that I'll discuss, but also economic and technological influence more broadly. I was doing this research into um, pretty obscure aspects of Soviet missile technology <laughs> uh, around 2015, 2016, 2017, when uh, companies like ZTE and Huawei uh, were first um, 
making it into the headlines of international newspapers. Uh, and these are, are Chinese tech companies um, that the US government was targeting for a variety of reasons because they were alleged to have violated Iran sanctions, um, because they were alleged to be involved in various intellectual property um, um, theft cases. And as the US government began implementing restrictions on tech firms in China, it became clear uh, to the surprise of many people, including many people in the US government, that China's leading tech firms were 100% reliant on imported silicon from a tiny number of countries. Um, and all advanced chips require US technology to produce. What an extraordinary fact. The, the chips that power all of our devices can only be produced by um, a tiny number of companies using machine tools uh, that are produced by just a couple of companies in the world, all of which require US technology. That seemed to me like an interesting fact. Uh, it was a surprise to China. It was a surprise to the United States. It was a surprise to the whole world. And over the past five years, um, alongside the rest of the world, I've come to realize the extent to which uh, the entire world economy, uh, all of our technology and the balance of military power depends fundamentally on the production of semiconductors, uh, which is uh, in, in, turn, uh, in turn produced and dominated by just a couple of companies. No other industry in the world economy is so defined by a tiny number of companies, by a small set of oligopolies, and in a number of critical cases, monopolies, in which one company has unique capabilities to produce a type of technology needed to make an advanced shift. Uh, and so I, I, I shifted from being a simple historian of the Soviet Union to someone who's writing a book about semiconductors by connecting those two dots, the centrality of computing power in the shifting military balance during the Cold War, and the reality that today, uh, U.S.-China competition is increasingly defined by a struggle to uh, influence and to control the supply chains of machines, software, and materials needed to make advanced ships. If you if you go to the Apple store down the street and buy a new iPhone, uh, inside that iPhone there will be uh, a dozen or so semiconductors, and the, the most important chip inside of an iPhone, uh, the main application processor, uh, will have carved into the silicon 15 billion transistors. 15 billion transistors. And to fit 15 billion transistors on a chip the size of your fingernail, each one of them is smaller than the size of a coronavirus. It's the most complex. Billion? I'm billion? Sorry. Million. Billion with a B. If it's mm -hmm. a billion transistors, each one smaller than the size of a coronavirus. I sort of knew that chips were complex, but <laughs> this is the most complex and sophisticated manufacturing humans have ever undertaken. Uh, and when I began this project, I thought of computing as something that happens sort of in the digital world up there in the cloud. No, computing is created by manufacturing, precision manufacturing that involves the most complex machines, the most purified materials, and the most expensive and specialized manufacturing processes that humans have ever undertaken, which is why there's one company in the world that has the expertise and the capacity to produce chips, for example, in a new iPhone. Uh, that company is called TSMC, the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, which today has 95% of its production, including all of its most advanced production in Taiwan. Taiwan today produces 90% of the world's most advanced processor chips, the type of chips that um, power almost all smartphones, uh, most PCs, data centers, cell phone towers, and the island of Taiwan in aggregate produces over one third of the new computing power the world adds each year. One small island produces one third of the world's computing power. And so uh, as uh, concerns grow about stability uh, in the Taiwan race, uh, the centrality of the semiconductor industry uh, uh, in Taiwan, or the centrality of Taiwan to the chip industry, uh, adds, I think, a, a new level of, of fascination, but also risk. And if something goes wrong in Taiwan, the implications will be felt far beyond uh, that island, far beyond China. In fact, it will be felt by the entire world economy because it will be impossible to produce almost any smartphones anywhere in the world the next year. You want the chips. And it's not just smartphones. It's PCs, it's data centers, but it's also all sorts of goods that we don't really think of as being high tech. Because today, for example, a new car will have a thousand semiconductors inside. And as we've learned over the last couple of years, if all you have is 999 chips and you need 1,000, your car will not roll off the assembly line. Now, many of the chips that go into cars are quite simple, like the chip that moves your window up and down, cost 20 cents, multiple companies can make it. Um, but many of the chips in cars are increasingly complex, like chips running the entertainment system or communications or especially autonomous driving features. Uh, and here's the case that the number of companies that can produce relevant chips are quite small and the aggregate capacity in Taiwan is extraordinarily large. So I was sort of surprised to learn that, <laughs> that the entire world economy hinged on 
piece in Taiwan, without which we'll not only be unable to produce smartphones, but also dishwashers and coffee makers and microwave production be disrupted in really dramatic fashion. But it turns out that the, the almost monopoly that Taiwan has in the production of advanced processor chips is really far from unique in the semiconductor supply chain. Because to make an advanced semiconductor, you need to source software tools, machine tools, materials from, again, a very small number of companies and countries. So today, in the chip, for example, uh, in a new iPhone, it will be designed using software produced by three companies that specialize in chip design, all of which are based in the United States. And these three companies have a basically oligopolistic position on chip design. You simply cannot design an advanced chip without buying software from each of these three companies. And if you envision the process of laying out 15 billion transistors on a, on a, piece, of, on a piece of silicon, you can understand why you need some pretty specialized software to do it. So chip software uh, is, a, is a pretty clear oligopoly um, uh, with, with really interesting geopolitical implications. Then you need to acquire chip designs and the ability to design chips, lay out the transistors such that they, they solve the problem you want to solve again, requires extraordinary specialization. And it turns out that for many types of chip design, there are just a couple of companies that have the relative expertise. So for example, in making smartphone processors, there are basically three companies uh, that, um, that are capable of making an advanced smartphone processor. If you're looking at making a PC processor, except Apple, PC, Apple computers, there are two companies that understand how to make a processor for a PC. No one else is anywhere close. They're miles behind. Uh, it's been a duopoly for decades in the market for PC processors. Mm -hmm. If you want to acquire a chip that is capable of training an AI system in an advanced data center, well, there are just two companies and really just one company that produces almost all of the most uh, advanced chips for training AI systems in data centers. And the list goes on. So chip design has extraordinary um, concentration effects in that segment too. Once you've got a chip design, you need to actually manufacture the chip. And this is the hardest part of the process because manufacturing semiconductors requires making 15 billion coronavirus sized transistors with basically perfect accuracy. You can get a couple ones wrong. There are some error correction techniques that let you uh, occasionally make errors, but you don't have much margin for error. Uh, and so the, the process of manufacturing uh, transistors at this scale, both by the millions, by the billions, but also at the nanometer scale, that's billionths of a meter, uh, requires the most precise and expensive machine tools ever made. Some of the, uh, the tools that you need uh, to manufacture an advanced chip include machines that are capable of depositing thin films of materials, just a couple of atoms thick, with basically perfect uniformity. Really hard to do. <laughs> uh, you also need machines that can etch tiny canyons into the silicon as you fashion your transistors. Uh, also a couple of atoms wide. Again, something very difficult to do. But the most complex of the machines needed to manufacture an advanced chip is called an extreme ultraviolet lithography machine. Uh, lithography is the process of shooting rays of light or shooting photons uh, through a mask. And then masks, sort of like a mask you wear on Halloween, will let light through certain parts of your face and not through other parts. If you want to pattern transistors on a chip, you use a similar mask and let the light shine through in certain places and not shine through other places. The light then reacts with chemicals uh, that either harden or wash away. And that's how you fashion mm -hmm. shapes on a chip. In the past, uh, when the chip industry was in its early phase, uh, lithography was done using visible light, which has a wavelength of several hundred nanometers, depending on its color. Um, but today, uh, wave light with a wavelength of several hundred nanometers is far too broad a tool to carve uh, shapes on silicon that are measuring a couple nanometers uh, in size. So today we use a type of light called extreme ultraviolet light, close to the X-ray uh, spectrum. And because it's close to the X-ray spectrum, uh, it's very difficult uh, both to produce and to reflect so that it hits your uh, piece of silicon. So today, uh, inside the machines that produce extreme ultraviolet light, uh, there's a ball of tin falling through a vacuum that's pulverized twice by one of the most powerful lasers uh, ever produced for a commercial device. The tin explodes into a plasma measuring 40 times hotter than the surface of the sun. The plasma emits... Uh, this extreme ultraviolet light at exactly the precise wavelength of 13.5 nanometers. It's collected by a dozen of the flattest mirrors humans have ever made, flattest mirrors humans have ever made, reflect this light, and then it's directed towards a silicon wafer and carves the transistors that, for example, power your iPhone. These machines uh, took 30 years to develop. They cost $150 million a piece. They require multiple 747s to move and they're monopolized by a single company 
the only company in the world that knows how to produce them in the Netherlands. Once you've got the machines, you still need to you still get the materials involved. Now, silicon, thankfully, is the uh, most widely found material in the Earth's crust, so we got a lot of silicon around. Um, but lots of the gases uh, and chemicals involved in ship making need to be perfectly pure, perfectly pure, because right now in ship making, we're already dealing with um, the, the random variation of, of atoms is causing uh, is causing defects in, in ship making. So if you have any impurities whatsoever in your chemicals, uh, it will cause defects in your chip making process. And so the ability to purify chemicals uh, with, with, with almost perfect precision is something that only a small number of companies can do, uh, largely Japanese companies. And then you need to bring all these different materials, software tools, designs, um, uh, and machine tools together to actually manufacture your chips. Uh, this is why uh, an advanced chip making facility today uh, is cost around 20 or $25 billion of the most expensive factories in human history. It's also why there are only three companies that are anywhere close to the ability to produce advanced processor chips, Intel in the United States, Samsung in South Korea, and in the leading position, TSMC of Taiwan. No one else is close. No one else will come close anytime soon uh, because of the amount of uh, very unique information for the extraordinary capital investment uh, needed to manufacture advanced chips. So chip making is pretty cool, I discovered. <laughs> <laughs> pretty interesting really? stuff going on. Um, <laughs> And, and and I think it would have been worth writing a book if it was just to understand, well, how does all this work? Uh, but, it, but it turns out that the process of how this works is something that is increasingly politicized. Now, it, it's been politicized from day one because the industry emerged out of the Cold War military industrial complex. But the process of moving from the first commercially available chip, uh, which in the early 1960s had four transistors on it, to the present day with chips with 15 billion or so transistors on it, that is a process that's been shaped by political choices uh, in the U.S. and in other countries. The, the chip industry emerged in Texas and Silicon Valley primarily with a bit of help from companies uh, in the Boston area. But over the past uh, several decades, it's, it's, it's internationalized. People often say globalized, but that's not true uh, it, for some very specific reasons we'll discuss. It's internationalized. Um, and it's internationalized in a very interesting way. The, the countries besides the United States that play a critical role in ship making are all close U.S. allies, or in the case of Taiwan, partners. Um, and that's not a coincidence, because since the middle of the Cold War, the U.S. government uh, has been very deliberate in trying to bind other countries to it by bringing them into electronics and semiconductor supply chains. And similarly, key countries in Asia, like South Korea, like Taiwan, uh, like Japan, and like Singapore, have deliberately targeted participation in electronic supply chains and in semiconductor manufacturing to bind themselves to the United States. It's not a coincidence, for example, that as the United States was losing the war in Vietnam and as discussion in the United States was ramping up about pulling back somewhat from Asia, that Asian elites in Taiwan and Singapore and elsewhere doubled down on their bets in electronics manufacturing precisely to get more US investment in their countries. Uh, the argument was in Taiwan, for example, that it wasn't clear in the early 1970s whether the United States would be willing to defend Taiwan, especially as relations were shifting from uh, Taipei to Beijing. But if Texas Instruments had a facility in Taiwan, maybe the U.S. would be more willing to defend them. That was a deliberate strategy uh, deployed by, uh, by, by key governments in Asia and supported by the United States. And there's, you know, there's great documentation from the Nixon era, for example, of really open discussions between Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore and um, and Richard Nixon about the, the geostrategic benefits uh, to both, uh, both parties of more American chip making investment mm -hmm. in East Asia. So the internationalization of the chip industry, a supply chain that stretches from the US to Japan, to Korea, to Taiwan was a deliberate construction um, in the Cold War, a combination of policies pursued by elites in uh, East Asia and by the US government. And that system worked very, very well uh, for a long time. It produced the efficiencies that have driven um, the, the, the concept known as Moore's Law, named after Gordon Moore, one of the co-founders of Intel, uh, who predicted in 1965 that the number of transistors per chip would double every year or two. And that, that prediction proved true not only over the one decade time horizon that, that, um, that, Go that Gordon Moore set out, but it's proven true basically to this day. So we had a doubling of computing power um, every other 
year, uh, which is possible because there's extraordinary efficiencies that have been gained by creating this very complex international supply chain where the Dutch company ASML focuses on lithography, American machine uh, tool firms focus on deposition and etching equipment, uh, California firms design chips, Taiwanese firms manufacture them. The specialization has worked in economic terms absolutely brilliantly. But in the past uh, seven or eight years, uh, politics has begun to intrude uh, into the chip supply chain in ways that were unexpected by many key players. The, the first challenge, the first political challenge to the contemporary uh, shape of the, the semiconductor supply chain came from China. Today, uh, the Chinese government um, believes that semiconductors are the most important vulnerability because today China spends as much money importing semiconductors as it spends importing oil. There's no product that China spends more money importing. And China imports chips because it can't make advanced chips domestically, uh, which is not a surprise. It's really hard to do. No one can make them domestically except for Taiwan. Uh, people always ask me, why, why, why can't China catch up? The answer is, well, no one's catching up. Everyone's falling behind the Taiwanese. It's nothing about China. It's about the rest of the world falling behind what Taiwan can produce. But the reality is that China's leaders feared that their reliance on imported chips was not only an economic vulnerability, but also a strategic vulnerability. And they're probably right about that. It's a very rational thing for them to assume. They're looking at supply chains, worried that the key components to all of their electronics industry, all of their machinery industry are being imported exclusively from geopolitical adversaries. What a horrible position to be in. And so in 2014, uh, Xi Jinping and the Chinese leadership uh, launched a number of policy programs designed to wean China off reliance on imported chips and build up domestic chipping capabilities. Uh, and so there were a number of investment funds set up at the national level, but also provincial and local levels designed to pour um, billions of dollars, probably on uh, the low tens of billions of dollars a year into China's chip industry. Um, and this uh, began to set off alarm bells across the region, first off in Taiwan, in Japan, uh, and then later in the United States, which was concerned that this industrial policy program might succeed at winning China's substantial market share, at threatening the profitability of um, of US firms and also of giving China access to cutting edge technologies. Because although the chip industry itself had predominantly spent the last several decades thinking about smartphones and PCs and consumer devices, which today consume almost all chips, the intelligence community and the military in the United States were also very aware that although they were small consumers of chips by volume, chips were increasingly important to their activities. Uh, because like the rest of the economy, and we talk about the internet of things and consumer devices. Well, the military is an internet of things too. Devices that communicate, that sense, uh, that must have compute, talk to data centers, talk to other devices. And so just as the rest of the economy is getting networked together, so too uh, was the military. And there's been, of course, a deep relationship between computing capabilities and intelligence and military capabilities from the earliest days. It's not just the example I gave you earlier of the first chips being put in missile guidance systems. It's also, if you think back, uh, to the, the UK computers in Bletchley Park that were cracking Nazi codes in World War II. There's been a fundamental relationship between computing and its application to intelligence and defense uses. And so the US was looking at China's efforts to move forward in computing technologies and saying, well, this is guaranteed to have strategic ramifications. If the gap between US computing capabilities and Chinese computing capabilities declines, uh, there will be uh, inevitable ramifications for both intelligence and for military systems. That's especially true because around five to seven years ago, uh, the U.S. launched what's called the third offset strategy, which was a strategy that was intended to match growing Chinese capabilities in terms of the number of systems China was deploying with more capable U.S. systems that relied ever more heavily on technology. And the technologies that were targeted were, above all, uh, using artificial intelligence capabilities and thinking about semi-autonomous and eventually potentially fully autonomous uh, military systems. And just like if you want to train a car to drive semi-autonomously, you need a lot of semiconductors in an advanced data center to train that car. So, too, if you want to train a drone to fly autonomously, you need access to very advanced data center capabilities to train the drone to fly. And so the U.S. military was beginning to bet on a semiconductor dependent military strategy, just as it seemed like China was going to substantially narrow the gap between American technological capabilities and Chinese technological capabilities. And so there was, from the Pentagon's perspective, a direct implication for the military balance um, as to whether China's efforts would succeed 
or fail. As a result of that, the um, United States has responded uh, with a number of different measures. One is the CHIPS Act, which is designed to uh, put more money into the U.S. chip industry with, with two goals. First is an insurance policy in case there is a war in the Taiwan Straits. And second, to try to boost the amount of R&D in the chip industry to keep America's technological advantage uh, over, um, over China. And then second, to restrict the transfer of certain tools uh, to Chinese chip firms. And in particular, the U.S. is focused on two types of tools, the software tools, the design chips, and the machine tools that manufacture chips. And because all the software tools are produced by U.S. firms, and because all of the critical machine tools are produced either in the U.S. or Japan or the Netherlands, mm -hmm. uh, the West in aggregate has a lot of influence over whether or not you can acquire the relevant tools. And for many technologies, uh, controls aren't effective because they can be produced relatively straightforwardly. There's multiple producers. But in the semiconductor industry, given the unique uh, skill sets, given the extraordinary capital intensivity, given the very, very long R&D time horizons, uh, creating your own version of an extreme ultraviolet lithography tool is not easy. In fact, it's very, very hard. No one's done it. Um, no one's even trying to do it so far as we're uh, really aware. Um, and that suggests that, uh, or suggested to the US government that controls on the software tools and the machine tools um, would have a meaningful impact in slowing down um, China's capabilities. And so this combination of the US response of subsidizing more, putting more money into R&D, while simultaneously trying to restrain China's advances by restricting the transfer technology uh, is right now reshaping the chip industry. Five years ago, uh, every foreign chip firm, US, Japanese, Korean, uh, Taiwanese was investing money in mainland China. Today, that investment has basically completely stopped. Um, five years ago, most big chip firms had R&D facilities in China. Today, that's basically completely ended. There's a couple of legacy uh, R&D facilities that persist, but the direction of travel is for by uh, And so when it comes to semiconductors, uh, what we're seeing right now uh, is, is I hesitate to use the, use the D word, but we're seeing decoupling in action. The industries are being decoupled, at least at the cutting edge. Um, the United States is going to use all of its powers uh, to try to limit the advances of Chinese firms in the chip industry. It's put multiple Chinese chip firms uh, on the brink of bankruptcy um, by restricting the transfer of tools and technologies. Uh, and I think it's probably not done in its willingness to move even further. Uh, because the U.S. government believes that the future of military power and the future uh, of intelligence capabilities will depend on computing. Future computing depends, uh, depends on chips. And therefore, the struggle to control access to the world's most advanced semiconductors is not just a question of relevance to your smartphone or to your dishwasher or to your car, uh, but also a question of great relevance to the future balance of military power uh, and geopolitical influence uh, in the modern world. So I'll up there perhaps for Fantastic. any questions. I apologize. I not, do not know a lot of people's names, but I will point and you'll forgive me. Okay, please, go ahead. Yeah, um, I'm Austin Cooper. I'm a, a postdoc in SSP. Um, thanks for this fascinating talk. Um, so my, my question is kind of a normative one. I'm, I'm going to ask it sort of on the policy side, but um, do you think the CHIPS, I mean, do you think the CHIPS Act is working? Do you think it could work in the sense that, do you think, I mean, you've talked about how difficult this is and the barriers, there's the capital investment, there's the specialized expertise. Um, if the U.S. <coughs> policy elites, right, on the financial economic side, on the security side, if they agree, you know, to fund a U.S. industrial policy behind semiconductor manufacturing, do you think the U.S. could effectively nationalize this international industry? Not, I mean, yeah, like so reshore it, right? Yeah. So I, I think, I think the question of will the Chips Act work needs to start with the question of what's the goal? Yeah. So self sufficiency is not the goal, hands down. The goal is not to domesticate the chip supply chain. You can find a couple of poorly educated members of Congress who will kick it that. Um, but the ones who wrote the legislation don't believe that. People implementing CHIPS Act don't believe that. So self-sufficiency is really not the goal. I think there are two goals for the CHIPS Act. Um, and this, this is not my, this is not me saying these are what the goals should be. This is my assessment of what the goals actually are. One is to, to buy um, an expensive insurance policy in case, of a, uh, in case of a disruption to Taiwan's ability to produce or export chips. 
uh, and two is to um, is to boost the rate of innovation and the amount of innovation happening in the U.S. in the chip industry. So on the first, <coughs> um, right now the U.S. produces 10-ish percent of the world's chips, consumes 25-ish percent, um, and Taiwan is absolutely critical. In basically all types of goods, Taiwan is critical. Um, so the the goal that the U.S. is pursuing on this front is to increase on the margin the amount of chips produced in the U.S., maybe to go from 10 to 15 or 20 percent, um, alongside similar efforts in Europe right now, in Japan, in India, in South Korea. Uh, and so I think, although the U.S. government hasn't stated numbers, and I don't think they'd be comfortable even stating numbers in private, I think uh, if you look at the, the policies being pursued by all these different governments and ask um, in 10 years' time what share of advanced processors they are produced in Taiwan, the goal is to get the number down from 90% to 50%. So not, not complete ability to survive without any disruption in case there's a, um, a war in the Taiwan Straits, but less disruption because you have more capacity in other geographies. That's a that's very different self-sufficiency. Mm -hmm. um, but the CHIPS Act has $39 billion for direct incentives. Um, you know, as I mentioned, one new facility can cost 20 or $25 billion. So it's just, it's not a huge sum of money. But if you wanted to, if you wanted to buy all of Taiwan's capacity and build in the United States, it would cost hundreds of billions of dollars, and Congress is not willing to uh, spend the money, possibly more, even more. Um, so the, the amount of capacity currently in Taiwan that you need to replicate if you want a perfectly effective insurance mechanism is, is probably too expensive um, for the U.S. political system in the stomach. Certainly, it's far beyond what Congress has already allocated. Um, so that's that's the insurance policy. Then on the, on the can more government money um, Produce more, more not only research but also new products as well. Um, I think here the jury's still out. The Commerce Department is still in the process of setting up um, their R and D efforts. I think we'll have to wait and see how they structure things to um, assess whether it will succeed or not. Uh, certainly, there's a lot of history of the U.S. government spending money very effectively in the chip industry. Um, if you look at a semiconductor, every aspect of a semiconductor has been funded by DARPA at some point. All the tools. Um, all the chip designs. In my book, I have a line that DARPA has literally shaped the transistors on your iPhone because the transition from flat transistors to 3D transistors, which happened half a, half a decade ago, was funded by was DARPA funded research uh, as well. So there's, there's a long track record of, of the US government spending money wisely in terms of long term chip RD. Um, but I think it's also the case that. Um, what we're what the Chips Act is trying to accomplish in the R and D front is not just more R and D, but ultimately more products that are sold. Uh, and so I think that's the other aspect of the question that's probably harder to do than, than just promoting R and D. So I, I'm I'm fairly confident that the incentives will result in more fab construction and therefore less reliance on Taiwan on the margins. Give me a shift uh, of degree, not a not a binary. I'm I'm less confident but hopeful that we're going to get more R&D and therefore better new products at the end. Um, but I'm less confident in that part than I am on the, the Taiwan insurance policy part. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Carol. Yeah. Uh, Chris, this was fantastic. Thank you so much. And I'm a total Luddite, so I'm out of my wheelhouse here. So I apologize in advance if this is a silly question. But I was wondering how the TSMC facility in Arizona yeah. kind of fits into your broader narrative. And one thing that I was curious about is it strikes me that because of this oligopolistic structure, they have an enormous amount of leverage because they indigenously produce these technologies. Yep. And so what incentive, I, I get the US side of this, but what incentive does Taiwan have? Not diversify. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Can you explain this kind of puzzle? I, yeah. I was curious about it. Yeah, so so TSMC, um, mm -hmm. or eight years ago, remember, really, um, began a process of opening facility in Arizona. It's a medium-sized facility. And uh, per TSMC's latest announcements, it will produce N minus one technology. So not the most cutting edge, but one generation behind. So all of the R&D, into next generation process technologies. And so that means every year TSMC introduces a new process that's able to make smaller transistors. Uh, so all that R&D today happens in Taiwan and under current plans, all that will continue happening in Taiwan. So right now the Taiwan, um, the uh, TSMC facility in Arizona is gonna be a very small share of the overall production. Uh, and it will be you know, pretty dependent on the continued operation of the facilities in Taiwan um, going forward. So I would say, um, it's not nothing, um, but it's far from uh, really dramatically changing uh, the situation. Now, you ask about you know Taiwan's incentives. It's a really interesting question because right now the U.S. is simultaneously um, 
simultaneously trying to convince Beijing that we're really going to defend Taiwan. And so all of you know Nancy Pelosi's visits, these are all part of a, a broader um, government-wide um, policy of making our deterrence more credible um, by, by political signaling, while simultaneously uh, telling uh, Taiwan that we'd like their most important business to move some of its production off the island. Uh, and so Ty Taiwan, 40% of exports are semiconductors. Most of that is TSMC. Uh, so there's, it's the largest publicly listed company in Asia. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to differentiate Taiwan's economic success from TSMC's economic success, or at least it has been historically. And so there's a very interesting uh, diplomatic discussion underway between the US government and the Taiwanese government about how this should be, uh, should be managed. I, I recommend to you a, a political piece yesterday on the dinner that uh, that Nancy Pelosi had uh, with Morris Chang, the founder of TSMC, uh, which I think brings to light some of the complexities in the relationship. Thanks, Pat. That's great. Mm -hmm. right. <clears throat> Thank you so much, um, Wright Smith, fourth year PhD student. So this is a bit out of what you've said, but I'm gonna ask you to speculate on two scenarios. Scenario one. There is a war in the Taiwan Straits, and the TSMC facilities are completely destroyed. Mm -hmm. What does that roughly look like the day after? And scenario two: there's a war in the Taiwan Straits, and China captures the TSMC facilities it's impossible. completely. It's, yeah, it's impossible. So, because the facilities are, you know, the, the, if if you or I walked in these facilities and saw the machines, we would have no idea what to do. We would have no idea what to do. And if 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 you're a engineer in China that has used older generation lithography machines, because there are no EV lithography machines in China, and you walked into, you have no idea what to do. So the a lot of the machine tools they only work because they're constantly serviced by the companies that sold them. And so the the way the servicing works in the industry is when they break, you need a spare part. Your spare parts, you know, you're not going to go to Home Depot, right? Um, and so the the companies that produce these tools know where all their tools are. So one of the companies that makes metrology tools, um, one of the uh, one of the interviews I did was talking with uh, one of the gentlemen who was in charge of metrology tool sales with a tool that was brought online three decades ago. And they sold, I think the number was 144 tools. And he knew three decades later where 143 of those tools were because you can't operate these tools without pretty regular servicing. Um, so you, you need the servicing from abroad to keep, to keep the tools working. You need the material imports from Japan and a little bit from the U.S. and Europe to keep the facilities working. And TSMC's customers are all um, are mostly um, uh, mostly American at this point. Uh, most of the wafers that TSMC produces are uh, U.S. firms. You need the personnel there. You need them all to do their job and not try to sabotage it. And you don't need very many saboteurs to make it not work. So I think the, the likelihood that China takes the facilities um, might be above zero, but the likelihood that China operates the facilities is, I, I think we can, and I, I, I take probability seriously, I think we can put it pretty close to zero. And destroys the facilities, probabilities? But I think the likelihood, if, if China is about to succeed in taking Taiwan, likelihood that somebody destroys the facilities, I think seems uh, mm -hmm. plausible. I can think of multiple parties that would have an interest in doing so. Uh, thank you. Um, I stand to ensure I'm uh, listing full bird, so um, I really enjoyed it. It's, um, it's a great read, uh, but it was a bit different than I expected. It was a lot about uh, the rise of the Silicon Age and the, the history of the industry. Um, so, so I have, but now you started discussing a lot of the more contemporary issues. So. I have three uh, three questions. The first one is um, is on this decoupling aspect. You start out the book by saying you cannot unbound the kind of industry here, but now when you answer the first question you got, you talk about the goal of decoupling is not self sufficiency. So you're basically then talking about Asia, Netherlands, and the U.S. Uh, but you think decoupling is working? That's the, the first question. What do you mean by with China? With China, that it's possible to strangle China's ambition in the semiconductor industry. Yeah. Um, so that's the first question. And then, if that is possible and decoupling is working, is that increasing the risk of war with China? Because to me, if you're in Beijing and you see this development of decoupling and China cannot access this technology, they also know that it will be very difficult to win a war in the 21st century. Um, 
So, so, so you see this as sort of increasing China's incentives to wage war, and if they do so, uh, and they do take out uh, TN, uh, well, the Thailand's facilities, even go after Samsung, even have a cyber attack on the Netherlands, uh, will then uh, actually the Chinese be relatively better off because then then the I'm actually the, the Americans are much more dependent on this technology than, than the Chinese. So then you're back to the what you discussed during the Cold War, the quantity versus quality uh, discussion. Yeah. Um, so the third question is about your title. You call it a ship war, but when you read the book, it's very much about competition. And you're moving into what I will call a conflict or what you call weaponized interdependence. <laughs> and before that, it was a race. But I don't, I don't see a war. So can you explain like your definition of war in, in this book and, and, and your definition of ship war. Okay. Um, so on, on the question of, of, <clears throat> of can the US try to decouple China from the chip supply chain? I think to, to start this discussion, um, when it comes to semiconductors, China doesn't produce a large number of semiconductors. Those that it produces are all low tech and low value at this point, with a couple of small exceptions. Um, in aggregate across the supply chain, software tools, machine tools, materials, et cetera, um, China produces around six or 7% of the overall supply chain. There's nothing that China produces that can't be produced elsewhere. Um, that's an interesting fact, right? Um, and so I think, you know, trying not to be, just trying to be objective, it seems like you know the coupling on semiconductors is not that hard because China's a really small player on semiconductors. Now that's different from electronics. Electronics is the semiconductors are put into smartphones and PCs and printers, and these are largely assembled in China. So the the reason China spends as much money importing chips as oil is partly because of domestic consumption, but also partly it needs to import a lot of chips to put in our iPhones and then export them abroad. Um, and so it's a very different question to ask: Can you? Uh, decouple China from electronic supply chains or machinery supply chains, that's a very, very different prospect. Now, what the U.S. government wants, what the ideal from the U.S. perspective is to keep China completely dependent on imported chips, which are the high value stuff in your iPhone, the chips in the display. Um, keep lower value stuff in China, the assembly, um, uh, simpler components, um, and not have to pay for any broader shifts in supply chains. That's the optimal strategy from the U.S. perspective. But from China's perspective, that seems like a pretty bad situation. You know, the goal is to move up the, the ladder to higher value uh, production for any for economic reasons as well as for uh, political reasons. So I think the, the question with the coupling is how far is the US willing to push in terms of bearing costs? And what is China willing to tolerate uh, in terms of US efforts to stop it from moving up the ladder? Now, the, China's clearly going to, has been spending and will spend a lot of money trying to domesticate key technologies. Um, and it's going to, over time, learn how to produce some of them. Um, the, the thing about the chip industry that is unique from most other industries is that the, the technological frontier moves so rapidly that you're not trying to catch up to a static target. You're trying to catch up to an exponential growth rate. Mm -hmm. um, and so historically, that's made it just very, very difficult to catch up. That's why, you know, again, as I said, the question isn't why why can't China catch up to Taiwan? It's why is everyone else falling behind Taiwan? The trend has been to fall behind Taiwan. And so the assumption that China will catch up to the cutting edge in 10 years' time seems like a very bold assumption to make, um, given that the trend of the last five years, 10 years is that other countries, Japan, the US, et cetera, have fallen behind the cutting edge rather than um, caught up. And, and the, the situation that China finds itself in now is that it's unable to pursue the strategies of catch up that worked in South Korea. And those strategies were to deeply integrate themselves in international supply chains, buy tools from the best suppliers, sell to the best customers, learn from them. Uh, trying to do it all on your own domestically seems like a very, very difficult strategy to me. And I, I think that because I know that Chinese firms would, per, would prefer not to have to pursue that strategy. So like revealed preference suggests um, they would rather be integrated uh, and they're unhappy being not integrated. Uh, so, you know, all of that makes me think that in fact, catch up is not the base case. I just... I just don't, I don't see why it would be the base case, given the structure of the industry, given the, the trend of falling behind, uh, given the unique challenges that China faces, and given the reality that, yes, it's a, it's a manufacturing superpower across many industries, but the chip industry, it's a minnow at this point. It's a small player.
it has less market share than Taiwan, less than Korea, less than Japan, less than the Netherlands. Um, and so that I think uh, ought to structure our perception of, of, of Chinese catch up. And you know, I could be wrong, obviously there's uncertainty here, um, but it seems to me, I, I started with the assumption, you know, Tencent is a big company, everyone uses WeChat, therefore Chinese tech is catching up. Um, and that is an assumption that I don't think withstands, uh, withstands very serious, um, very serious inquiry on, on the question of uh, on the military risk. So I think, you know, if if Chinese leaders accept my analysis, then I think you could be right that the U.S. strategy of of trying to hold back China um, does bring the risk of an increased willingness to take risks now because the window is closing. <clears throat> I think. I'm, first off, I'm not sure that Chinese leaders accept my analysis. It seems to me that the Chinese political leadership thinks they can catch up. And I'm, I'm repeatedly struck by the gap between uh, what people in the Chinese chip industry tell me and say publicly in industry publications and the messages that appear to be being received by political leaders. And I think it's understandable because right now the Chinese government is handing out billions of dollars. And their question is, if we give you a billion dollars, will you catch up? Of course, you're saying, <laughs> 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 Why not? Gladly, I'll catch up. Um, so I think they're getting bad information on the likelihood of catch up, um, but I could be wrong. That's, that's, that's sort of a, it's a hard to test hunch, I think, rather than a, an empirical claim that I'll, I would kind of stand strongly behind. I think also that, um, that the, the, the severity of the closing window seems to me to be not that severe. And what I mean by that is, you know, one of the questions I'm often asked is, well, you know, the U.S. cut off oil exports to Japan in 1941, and then they bombed Pearl Harbor months later. And that to me just seems like a fundamentally different situation. You know, it wouldn't have been possible to drive cars in Tokyo <laughs> by, by, by early 1942 um, had there not been a policy change. Whereas all the U.S. is saying now is your data center companies, can't buy the most advanced ships, you can still buy less advanced ships. Um, so we're talking about of the, of the share of chips coming to China, iPhone chips, PC chips, car chips, totally unaffected. It's just specific chips for training AI and data centers will be impacted. Um, the level of knowledge of political leaders in any country about these, you know, about this is low, right? Um, there, so I, I, my sense is that actually uh, Chinese leaders aren't nearly as fixated on this as Japanese leaders are fixated on oil supplies. And I think that's a rational response because there is some uncertainty over, over time because there's uncertainty both about the way technology develops and about the ability to apply it to military systems. Mm -hmm. And so although I've sketched out um, my view as to how the ability to produce advanced semiconductors will impact the military balance, I think there's enough uncertainty um, about the 10-year trajectory where I don't think it dramatically changes whether Chinese leaders would be willing to risk conflict. You have two fingers? Yeah. So Chris, um, first, great talk. Two, I want to push back a little bit. So Deloitte has uh, survey numbers on chip production, semiconductors. <coughs> and their numbers actually show China's current levels. Again, it's not highest end, but quite comparable to South Korea, a little higher than Japan. But that's chip production, right? Chip production, yeah. semiconductor yeah. production. And I'm noting that because the characterization that you offered suggested that there were way behind. Again, we agree on the super high end stuff, but overall, they're a pretty significant player and the rate of growth has been astonishing. That's yeah. the first point. Okay. Second point is that let's not talk necessarily so much about war, but about the consequences of decoupling on Chinese incentives to develop independent capacity to do stuff. So let's not focus on the next three years. It takes longer than that. But if you're talking 10 years, China has displayed a remarkable capacity in a number of areas to develop autonomous capacity to do technologies in bio and other areas. And if we're squeezing the Koreans and the Taiwanese to reduce their profile in Japan, that third party pressure for decoupling could have the effect of logically Chinese leaders developing independent capacity. We would do the same. They are dependent on the machine tools and other things. And are we in fact engaging this strategy that in the short term might create some disruptions in our supplies, frankly, as well as theirs. And over the long term will greatly increase China's incentives 
to develop an autonomous capacity to stand apart. Yeah. Yeah. So on, on the first question, on, on the share of chips produced, so China's a, a, a medium-sized producer of chips, but if you look at the supply chain, so the, the tools that go in at the materials, right. If you want to make a semiconductor in China, you can do it using machine tools imported from the U.S. Netherlands, chemicals imported from Japan, software imported from the U.S. So across the supply chain, China is a tiny player, um, and almost all of the chip making in China is done on imported tools. So, so, so yes, they're they're building a, a fair number of low end chips, um, but you know it's the supply chain that matters. Is <laughs> the hard part? The hard part is building the tools. Um, building low end chips is something that multiple countries. Um, so I, I think the fact that there's more low end chip production happening doesn't really um, doesn't really I think change my emphasis on look at the aggregate weights of China in the supply chain. Look at the fact that there's nothing China can do that can't be replicated outside. Look at the fact that China's most advanced companies rely fundamentally on imported machine tools. That, that is a really important fact. Now, as you say, does China have a stronger incentive now to develop those machine tools? Absolutely. Absolutely, it does. Uh, and so the question is going to be, how strong is that incentive? Who is that incentive felt by companies versus governments? Um, and and what, what are the time horizons involved? Regarding time horizons, you know, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to say. China's had an incentive. So the U.S. first began restricting machine tool exports to um, certain Chinese firms around four years ago, five years ago. Um, and in that time, it's not obvious that Chinese firms have made dramatic progress um, uh, in catching up to the cutting edge, or really actually any progress at catching up into the cutting edge, they made progress, but the cutting edge has moved forward too. So the gap, so far as any sort of analysis can show, has remained basically the same. If you're a, a Chinese company, and most chips in China are made by private companies, uh, you know your goal is to produce chips and to sell them, uh, not necessarily uh, to support the, product, uh, the production and the development of uh, homemade machine tools. And so what we found empirically is that wherever Chinese firms can access foreign tools, they keep doing so. They, they make backup plans too, but they keep accessing foreign tools. Um, that, that's been the experience in the last five years. Now, will that change further uh, in the future? On the margin, it will. Um, but I guess I'm, I'm struck by the extent to which Chinese firms express continued desire to buy foreign tools, which is why that China is now one of the biggest markets, in some cases, the biggest market. Uh, export markets for tool makers in the US, in Japan, and in the Netherlands. And so then the other question is, well, what's the time horizon over which China can domesticate relevant tools? You know, I think these tools are really, really hard to make. I think they're really hard to make. And I think that um, both because I've described you before, and because if you look at the industry, there are, are, are five main companies that produce the most advanced machine tools, one in the Netherlands, three in the US, one in Japan. They've been in their market position for 30, 40, in some cases, 50 years. The competitive moats are extraordinary. Uh, and, and they're extraordinary because the complexity of the engineering involved, the need for absolute precision and absolute reliability is so high. And you know, reliability is something that, um, that international historians like myself don't normally think about. But one of, uh, one of the interviews I did with one of the ASML said, you know, we, we've got hundreds of thousands of components in our machine. They don't actually know how many components they have. They, they know the laser system, which is just one of the components in an EV machine has 457,000 components. That's just one of the kind of key components. So in aggregate, the machines have, call it a million components. If each one of those components breaks once a year, the machine never works, right? So, so we're not just talking about doing something, replicating this once in a lab. You need to replicate it so that it works all the time with basically perfect accuracy. So, you know, but as I think about in the economy, you know, hard things to replicate, I think this is the hardest to replicate uh, in terms of types of machinery. And that's why I guess I would, I would, I would bet on this being just very difficult for China to replicate over the relevant time horizon. And again, the relevant time horizon is, is set by the rate at which Moore's law gallops forward. That's the other aspect of critical. Yeah. Um, okay. uh, just to really talk, I'm Zoe, I'm actually an electrical engineer and a digital designer. So my, I have a question <laughs> on the historical aspect that you mentioned that you has encouraged the supply chain being internationalized in, in East of Asia. So why did U.S. have the incentive to um, like facilitate uh, the research development in uh, Asia instead of in U.S. native way? So I think the, the, the U.S. had a strong incentive 
at least there's different parts of the U.S. The U.S. government had a strong incentive um, to uh, to try to bind Taiwan, Singapore, et cetera, to the U.S. by having more semiconductor investment in those countries from the 60s up to the present. That was the U.S. government's view. Um, now, you're right to suggest, I think, that if the U.S. government had been asked, would you like cutting edge research in Taiwan or in the U.S., it would have said the U.S. But at the time that that TSMC began to grow, um, both in terms of volume of chips produced and in terms of its role at the cutting edge, it was the 1990s, the 2000s, 20, and up to the early 2010s when Taiwan war risk was not very high on anyone's agenda. Um, the U.S. government for a couple of decades basically stopped thinking about semiconductors. Companies involved didn't really care, rightly or wrongly, they just weren't interested in these issues. Uh, and so the risks they were worried about were earthquakes, uh, not, not wars. Um, and TSMC is such an extraordinary company. I mean, their, their ability to, to produce uh, technological advance year after year with basically no disruption uh, is unparalleled. They produce better chips at lower price, with better customer service than anyone. And so their customers, Apple, AMD, NVIDIA, et cetera, were very supportive of their growth because uh, TSMC is what made smartphones possible. Um, TSMC is, is what uh, they make all AI chips today, basically. Um, and so from industry's perspective, it worked great. It worked great until people in Beijing and Washington and Tokyo started thinking about the geopolitical ramifications. And, and I think especially as the military balance began to shift in the Taiwan Straits in China's favor, then concerns about US reliance, Japanese reliance on chips coming from Taiwan began to, um, began to intrude on what otherwise the industry would be very happy to continue mm -hmm. far into the future. And so the industry right now is sort of in a, a state of catching up to, I think, a new political reality that they're kind of unhappy about <laughs> uh, and certainly weren't expecting. Yeah, Chris, um, thank you so much, John Minnick, PhD student here in the department. Um, awesome presentation. I also love the book, thought it was great. Uh, I, I'm, I just love your thoughts on the export controls, um, in particular, whether you think we've reached at least a temporary sort of equilibrium or there is more to come in 2023. If there's more to come, will it be deeper into semiconductors, sort of restricting maybe DUB or access to older chip designs, or will it be broader tar targeting things like battery technology generally there? And then I guess just related to that, uh, you know, I mean, given that the U.S. now has secured some degree of buy-in from the Dutch and Japanese governments, I just wonder if there isn't a major escalation in export controls, is there really any kind of possibility of defection from various U.S. partners, and, and who would be the yeah. sources of defection we don't care about that yes. might help China, basically. Mm -hmm. So I, I think on the on the allied defection question, you know, I think there's the challenge of export controls is that they're super technical, and that political leaders only think about export controls when it's like brought to their agenda, whereas companies think about them on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And so one of the dynamics you have, I think, is you assume regular corporate lobbying to weaken export controls, mm -hmm. and pl politicians engage with them once every six months. And so I think one interesting question in, in the U.S., Japan, and the Netherlands will be that dynamic. Um, and so I, I think it will be interesting to look in one year's time at uh, in what, what sense sales have actually shifted. Um, you know, there's a lot of really, really technical, <laughs> really technical stuff involved in these export controls. You need to understand the difference between different types of deposition machines or you know, there's multiple types of DUV, which is the previous generation of lithography system. Um, you know, politicians now understand they at least know the word lithography. Um, <laughs> but you know, I, I think I, I'm not insulting anyone in Congress to say that the level of expertise is not particularly deep. So, so I think that, that's an interesting dynamic is the corporate lobbying versus. Um, in terms of the allied defection, you know, look, I, I think the media narrative on this has been, the headline has been, US succeeds in pressuring Japan and the Netherlands to join China. I, I think that's an inaccurate description, at least as a, at least vis-a-vis Japan. I think if you know if you read uh, the Medi Minister Nishimura's speech in Washington uh, in January, I think you will find as hawkish a statement on what uh, Medi calls economic security uh, as from any world leader <laughs> in a very long time. So um, I think Japan has gone through a very big shift on its own um, over the past couple of years that has paralleled U.S. shifts. But you know, some of the interviews I did with Trump administration officials, they said, you know, the Japanese helped us understand how important this was. And so I think, you know, American headlines always say, U.S. asked Japan to do this. Yeah. I'm not sure that's the right way. Yeah. I'm really not sure that's the right way to describe it. Um, with, with Korea and Taiwan, they're both in interesting positions. 
know, Taiwan, we talked about the domestic economic uh, considerations that are at play. It's a really tricky balance uh, for the U.S. and Taiwan. Taiwan needs both to keep its advantages vis-a-vis -vis China for economic reasons. It needs them for military reasons. Um, it needs to show the U.S. it's doing enough on its own defense in aggregate to keep the U.S. bought into its defense. Um, but it also doesn't want to bear excessive economic costs. That's the calculus in, in Taiwan. In Korea, I think it's, it's, it's quite interesting in Korea. Korea produces uh, primarily memory chips, which are more commoditized chips. Um, and one of the types of memory chips called NAND memory chips, which is sort of a longer term storage chip, uh, is where uh, there was a Chinese firm that was basically at the cutting edge about to begin high volume manufacturing this year. And so the greatest beneficiaries of the latest US export controls are a couple of Korean firms <laughs> that were just about to face competition uh, because it, it's commodity chip markets, high volume, low differentiation, where China was best placed to succeed first, naturally. Um, and so Korea, I think, uh, is quietly aware of the fact that the US has very helpfully taken some of its critical commercial competitors off the table. Um, also, Korea doesn't really produce any of the technologies that are being limited right now. Um, so the, the machine tools are not produced in Korea. The EDA tools, software design tools are not produced in Korea. Most of the, um, really almost all, I think most, certainly most of the relevant AI chips that are being restricted are produced in Taiwan by some small exceptions to that, but that's generally true. Um, the one place where Korean firms have been impacted is, um, a couple of Korean firms have production facilities in China and now they've got a complex issue of, will the U S let them import tools mm -hmm. To production facilities in China own and operate by Korean firms. Thus far, the answer has been yes, but there's some complexity involved there. Um, so that's that's how Korea thinks about it. But for all of the all of the allies, if you will, the story is never as simple as U.S. twists arm, uh, allies respond. There's a lot of really interesting domestic, commercial, political, etc. dynamics at play, which is why this has been a lot easier, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah the, the media gloss six months ago was Biden administration fails to produce multilateral control system, therefore action laterally. You know, that's not the right explanation. Yeah, yeah thanks. Um, and then I'm a geoscientist and also just a student. Um, so I'm wondering if you can comment on the tension between uh, the employees and the capital intensive processes that kind of require this concentration of power. But also the need for innovation. Yeah, great question. Great question. Yeah, I mean it's it's tricky because we we talk about wanting startups and innovation, and yet in the chip industry, um, you know, as I said, in key segments of the supply chain, you actually have oligopoly uh, and deeply entrenched market positions. Um, and in a lot of segments of the supply chain, the capital intensivity means that startups are really kind of hard to imagine. You know, you're not gonna you're not gonna raise twenty five billion dollars for your startup. <laughs> Um, there's just no way, uh, even if you have government backing, you know, unless you're in China, you're not gonna raise $25 billion. Um, so, so that, that does present huge barriers to entry in, <coughs> in chip design, the, the capital costs are a lot lower. So chip design, you need to pay for software tools, which are kind of expensive, but you're talking, you know, in the hundreds of thousands or low millions rather than, um, in the, in the billions for your first get off the ground, um, months or year. And so you've seen a lot more startups in the chip design space. Um, and that's also where smaller teams and chip design can make progress. Um, so that's that's where you've seen uh, seen most of the startup action. There also is is some happening in the machine tool space for specific components. So if you learn how to do a, a specific part of one of the deposition processes or etching, etching processes slightly better, you can, you can create your component and sell it to one of the big firms. And so you see a lot of acquisition activity. Um, by the big machine tool companies and also by the big software tool companies buying smaller firms that can get plugged into these broader systems. Whether that's whether that's an optimal system, I I think is an interesting question. I think it's just given the the capital intensivity of the machine tool and fabrication step, I I struggle to see alternatives. So there's a question way in the back. Uh, that might be me. Uh, so I'm interested in what how critical this sort of difference between N and N minus one is yeah. for these different chip sizes. Um, there's obviously a pretty long lag, I think also between, well, I'm assuming between new chips and the you know, nanometer sizes and it being integrated into a military technology yeah. as well. So what are the downstream military implications of being at N minus one? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the, the, the simplest way to conceptualize N versus minus one is like, you know, a new iPhone versus a two-year-old iPhone. Um, uh, Cause that's, that basically gets you the, 
um, one node difference. Um, so, you know, one, one differential is not huge. You get slightly better battery life with the cutting edge. You get, you know, a couple new features, but it's not, it's still an iPhone, right? Um, if you're 10 years behind, it's a different story. I mean, remember where iPhones were when they were first released? Like streaming video wasn't a thing. It was impossible to stream video on the first iPhones. Um, if you're 20 years behind and you're still playing Snake on your phone. Um, <laughs> so, but, but yeah, a single node is, is, is not really crucial. Um, except probably uh, in data centers. And so, you know, we think of, uh, here's the thing, we think of weapons factories as being buildings where metal is fashioned, right? You can make an airplane and tank. I think in, in, in 30 years time, we're gonna realize that weapons factories of the future are data centers. Mm -hmm. Because data centers are where you're gonna train systems to, to operate more effectively. And we already see this with all sorts of consumer products we don't really realize. They're, they're, they're designed and they're, the, the AI is trained in data centers. That's where cars learn how to drive. They learn how to drive by aggregating lots of data, running through data center. Um, that's where chat GPT learns how to write sonnets. It's in a data center. And that's where drones learn how to fly and, um, and sensors learn how to sense more accurately. Computer vision systems learn how to recognize cats versus dogs or tanks versus cars. It's all in data centers. And so I think if, if, if you accept my view that the data center is the weapons factory of the future, uh, then having a better data center um, really does seem to matter. And if you look at um, the way that Google or Amazon or Microsoft invest, they're always buying the, the, the latest generation chip. Now, is it possible, you know, I have this debate occasionally, is it possible that China's not going to have the most cutting edge you're going to have, you know, N minus three when it comes to AI chips or N minus four in probably five years' time? Is it possible you just build a data center that's eight times as large and can do the same amount of processing? You know, I think there's, it, that might be true to some extent. Data centers don't scale linearly uh, without losing efficiency, so there's some issues there. Um, but could we see China trying to find ways around it like that? I think that's that's interesting and possible to ask. Um, but I, I don't think it's right to say, um, and I think I'm well within consensus in asserting that if you want to train AI systems, being N minus five is a real disadvantage, especially if it's not just one facility, but across your society. Uh, and so I think a key question, if you ask the efficacy of the export controls on AI chips for military systems in 10 years time, I think it's going to be really important, actually. Is China N minus three or is it N minus six? Because um, Jake Sullivan's strategy, as he laid it out uh, in September of last year, is to grow the gap with China. So right now, you know, China can produce, let's call it 10 or 7 nanometers at home, we can debate, uh, and TSMC can produce three. Um, so there's a, you know, three generation gap-ish. Um, the US government wants to grow that to six generations by the by the middle of the decade. Uh, and so the extent to which that succeeds or whether it stays a three or four generation gap, I think is actually probably um, a really significant question. I, I struggle to have a confident answer as to what specifically the gap will be, but I think it probably does matter precisely for training AI systems. Yeah. It's like basically the same as the kind of technology. One thing you didn't address is the same as, I guess, acquisition, right? So, like, I can understand yeah, the yeah, market, yeah. the problems like really important, right? Like, being ahead to develop yeah. like, the actual power zones is like, super important yeah. to have a more data But how much does it really matter for the Intel and military services, military Intel services, that who are actually going to be using it, <laughs> that uh, there's this difference in the due to like acquisition? Yes, right. So, I think. I think, um, you know, first off, you, you've got a fighter jet that's flying for 30 years, but it's electronic set yeah. Yeah, upgrade. Um, so that's, that's, that's one thing. Um, but it's certainly true that the, the product cycle for fighter jets is a lot longer than the product cycle for iPhones. Um, and, and I think that is a, that is a problem um, that, you know, we're never going to get down to one year uh, product cycles like we have for iPhones for military systems. Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, if you, if you talk about, you know, the discussion underway, do we, have too much emphasis on large legacy platforms and not enough on smaller systems with more product cycles. That is where I think the question of are you accessing the most advanced capabilities does um, does come into play. I think there's also um, there's also a question about if you're thinking about US China dynamics, is you know, we we understand that there's a gap between the cutting edge chip and when it gets into military systems. Now an empirical question to which I don't know the answer is is the gap larger or smaller? In China. So cutting edge, let's say dual use chip arrives in China. Does it end up in a Chinese system faster or slower on average? Mm -hmm. No, 
That's an interesting question to, to do research on. I, I don't even know how you begin to research that. Um, <laughs> and you want to have to <laughs> uh, systems, but, but that's also an interesting kind of part of the question. Uh, but but I think I think you're right to say that US strategy is not only about keeping a computer advantage, it's also critically dependent on applying that as rapidly as possible capabilities. Um, yeah, and this is something that you know the Pentagon historically, I guess it does okay at in comparison with other international players, but I think there's room for go for it. But the other thing I want to ask is what does uh could you, could you be more clear on what types of chips I understand that the yeah. other facility in Arizona is going to be producing? Like yeah. is that designed for commercial production? Is that designed? like where are those chips going? Yeah, it'd be like in iPads. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, like so I think that that will probably be accessible uh to um to uh, US government uses as well. Um right now the US government, so the long time the US government had its own fabs, uh, and that became too expensive. We have enough money to build our own aircraft carriers, but not our own semiconductor facilities. Um, and then the U.S. government had what they trusted foundries that they operated with commercial partners. Um, but even that's getting really tricky because um, the trusted foundries are now multiple generations behind the cutting edge. Um, and so there's a, a desire to find new ways to work with cutting edge companies. And the challenge right now is that they're all in um, other countries uh, with varying security uh, concerns. That's that's also a big issue. Thank you. Thanks so much for your talk. You began by talking about how the Soviets were not able to close the computer gap, even though they could see the need for it in advance. And it seems to me the center of this talk is about barriers to entry. And I want to understand what chips are as a member of a category of technologies that states have competed with. Right? So that's a long list of important technologies that they've competed over. And I think of centrifuges, super hard to build, special uh materials you can't find anywhere uh internationally regulated super high tolerances but there it's a different barrier to entry because you can steal a design for a centrifuge that sort of matters i assume you can steal a design here matters less so the nature of the barriers to entry probably varies by technology and i'm what i'm hearing you say is the special barrier to entry that makes this different from other things and I'm inferring this, is the rate of change and improvement each year where the changes are qualitatively important. That is to say this rapid churn of innovation and the integrated nature of the supply chain. And I guess I'm just skeptical. You know, I guess my question is, so there's, if that's a member of a class where it's, you can't catch up, what's the, what are other members of that class? Technologies where states weren't able to catch up if they thought their survival depended on it and they had time and money. Yeah. And, and yeah. by implication, computers is one of those for the Soviets, yes? Yes, right, right. So I, yeah, I, that's, that's a question I spend a lot of time thinking about. I, I don't know that I've got a, a, a definitive, well-theorized answer, but I'll give you some, some thoughts that I've been developing over the last five years. Um, so first off, I think... I think that there is nothing else in our economy that that has demonstrated Moore's law like growth for over half a century. You know, like I, you know, imagine if airplanes flew twice as fast every other year. We, just, <laughs> we, we can't imagine it. Um, nowhere else do you get those sustained productivity improvements at such an extraordinary rate. Like you, some industries have them for like two years, right, uh, or four years, or, or a decade. But now we're on we're on decade six of, of Moore's law, almost decades. Um, so. I, I do think there is something unique about Moore's law um, that got us from four transistors per chip in the early 1960s to 15 billion today. Um, I, I haven't found another good that operates in, with exactly the same exponential growth, uh, but maybe someone has one. Um, so I think that, that's part of it. I think second is, I think there are certain types of advanced manufacturing that have really complex supply chains, require a lot of really, a, a lot of precision, where it does seem like stealing designs isn't enough. Jet engines is the other obvious example. Um, now, maybe that's the only example that everyone has, so I think it's <laughs> not a good one. Um, but I think there, there's some interesting similarities between the two. I guess my real question is, are you going to argue that this is a category that has one number? I guess I wrote a book with the title, <laughs> so I kind of have to. Um, <laughs> chips are unique to all other things. I mean, I... I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I think I would basically assert that that I, I've struggled to find a Moore's law in any other industry. 
in DNA sequencing and synthesis. Could be, could be, yeah, could be happening right now. That's happening right. now. That's right. That yeah. That's it. No, I, I think, yeah. Although, Chris, right your now, your really point happening. is beautiful. I'm thinking 15 years back when people were talking about how long can Moore's law continue. And the clincher in the arguments back then was don't you realize that if you're predicting that Moore's law continues, you're going to be talking about a, a billion semiconductors? <laughs> 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 Obviously <laughs> absurd. <laughs> Please. Hi, Chris. Um, nice to meet you again. I'm Diana, there you PhD. Um, uh, my question is actually on um, your what, what you talked about the coordination within the industry. So how would you? So you talked about initially it was the U.S. investment going out that basically established um, Japan, uh, Taiwan, Singapore's their sort of. Uh, uh, initial capacity in doing the semiconductors and uh, electronics. How would you describe the coordination within the industry now? Is there still this limit of uh, this this sense of uh, U.S. guided or U.S. led, and then other other people follow suit, or within the you know the five countries that you mentioned, um, they are sharing powers equally and they're doing things basically um, you know on the same levels. Um, that, that's a really good question. I, I think so. The, the, the downstream customers in the chip industry, the, the companies that are, are buying chips, um, or the, the companies that are paying to have chips manufactured for themselves, are largely US firms. So Apple, AMD, NVIDIA, Qualcomm, et cetera. Um, there's one big Taiwanese firm, MediaTek, in there. Um, but the, the big ones are, are US firms. So in, in some ways, because they're the customers, they can call some of the shots. But I, I wouldn't overplay that statement um because you know you you need to keep asml happy so it delivers the tools that you need like there are no other options and, and tsmc um you, you can go to samsung to produce at something pretty close to what tsmc can do um but most companies i think it's fair to say go to samsung so they can get better pricing from tsmc mm -hmm. and they prefer to go to tsmc as often as they can um i think is sort of the industry standard um so i, I wouldn't say that the industry today is is sort of Dictating U.S. firms dictate the industry, but if you look across the supply chain, U.S. firms are forty-five percent of revenue, so they're by far the biggest player. With uh, Taiwan, Korea, Japan, fifteen-ish percent each. Um, so the U.S. is still the you know, elephant in the room, as the uh, the metaphor to use, or, or what? But it's certainly the U.S. firms are still the biggest um, players in terms of size. All right, so we have. At least four people on my list, John, you just became number five, and we have five minutes left. So let's do, right. So there were two questions in the way back. Let's do those two in the last over the Nosley and go. So uh, my question is for how long do you see China tolerate the new policies that the US, uh, you know, the chip war is one aspect of it, but obviously the reduced manufacturing in China uh that you know apple and everyone else is moving to india and, um, and all the other countries so for how long do you see them tolerate it or where do you see the tipping point yeah um this question may not be fair given the time constraints but you talked a lot about the trend of folks not being able to keep up with taiwan in particular folks not being able to keep up with tsmc tsmc is sort of the star of the show here right how and why like how not fair, but <laughs> schematically, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? How how and why does TMC, TSMC end up as the global leader head and shoulders yeah. the way you're telling the story above everyone else? Yeah. Okay, so take those two. Okay. Them a little later. 30 seconds each. 30 okay. seconds. <laughs> Sorry. So, so when TSMC was founded, it was the only company in the world that was not designing chips, only manufacturing. So a new business model. And that business model let it scale far beyond its, its rivals, gaining economies of scale and, and financial terms, but also technological terms, because the more chips you produce, the more you hone your production processes. Uh, and so that has let it become the world's biggest and most advanced chip maker. So smart business model uh, plus pretty good execution uh, is, is the 30 second answer. Uh, um, in terms of electronics, look, I, I, think, I think it's still an open question as to how much shifting in electronics assembly we're gonna get. Right now, um, most electronics are produced in China, PC, smartphones. Um, it's certainly the case that over the last six months, most big OEMs have made public costly statements about new investment in Vietnam, India, uh, Southeast Asia, Mexico, et cetera. 
I think the fact that companies are taking public and costly steps suggests that there's going to be some shift in the electronic supply chain. Uh, I think it's an open question as to how far this really goes. Is it does 20% of production end up in other countries? Does 40%? I, I don't know the answer to that, but I think it's a really important question. Um, you ask, uh, will China tolerate it? Well, what what exactly are the what's what's the way you wouldn't tolerate it? The, the challenge that China faces is it's trying to keep foreign companies invested and it's trying to keep R and D relationships viable. And so disruptive steps that China takes hastens the process of decoupling. And so that's why China's actually in, you know, I, I described in the book that the US is in a position of escalation dominance in this sphere, because the US is severing relationships and China can't retaliate because any retaliatory steps will cause companies on their own to pull back. Right, Nasli and Phil, please. It, it, it's a variation on the, on the tolerance question. The only part I have, first of all, excellent talk. The only part I have some difficulty with is the, the final conclusion I'm reaching from your talk is that, well, the Chinese have no option but to sit back and enjoy it. That part, I have a, a difficulty based on how we know China reacts. Uh, but, but maybe the solution, however one, one wants to think about this, has to, is intertemporal, what time frame yes, we have. Yeah. And you mentioned that several times. Yeah. So Chris, great talk. I've heard this virtually. I'm a naval war colleague, Bohan. And um, I think you just answered my question, that last comment, but I want to ask it again. So U.S., good research around here about how difficult it would be for China to invade. You made a good comment about they can't actually utilize that. But a Chinese punishment strategy against Taiwan is still brought up as something di difficult to deter. Uh, why wouldn't these companies be the number one part on the target mm -hmm. list? What deters the Chinese military from targeting these facilities? Yeah, so I think that the common answer to that is that these facilities power China's economy, just like the rest of us, China's relying on them too. Now, you know, we can debate to what extent uh, economic would be costs more than. You know, more versus less, I don't know, but if TSMC's facilities were destroyed, we'd all be in a Great Depression. So we can sort of <laughs> pivot in the margin. I mean, you know, <laughs> that's 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 <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there would be hardly any smartphones produced the next year, half trillion dollar business wiped out, PC production dramatically disrupted, data centers, telecom infrastructure, cell phone towers, and then cars. You know, the last two years, there was a chip shortage caused by a surge in demand. So the world produced 8% more chips in 2020, uh, a double digit increase of rate in chip production in 2021. We had a chip shortage because demand surged higher. And as demand surged higher, car companies faced over $200 billion of disruptions globally in a year where we were producing more chips than previously. So try to source a thousand chips for a car with Taiwan, which produces one third of computing power so okay. economic interest, Trump, national. Well, I don't know. Interest. This is the question, but yeah. the answer to your question is: if China is deterred, it will be uh, from this type of strategy. It'll be because of economic interest. Okay. But we can debate whether that's. Right. So the only thing is left is to thank Chris for a great talk. <laughs>